Stand-up is a very American art form. The way that it actually started was guys like Lenny Bruce would be talking to the audience in a strip club in between performers. At a strip club? Yeah, that's where it started. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. How do jokes compete with Come on, this exactly. is hard. American stand-up is like boom, boom, yeah, boom, boom, boom. I went home for Thanksgiving and I'm talking to all these friends and they're like, dude, it is so cool what you do. Even though these people seem like they have a great life and it's easier, they're also looking at you like, I'm jealous. I wish that I had whatever weird thing in you that I could do that too. One of my favorite things to do with Dean, whenever I'm at the creek, if I was working the door and someone would walk in and I would see him there, I'd be like, do me a favor, go up and say, are you Dean Stanfield? And then they would and he'd be like, yeah, you want a phone? or something come on over here i'll buy you a beer and it's just like they don't know who he is but he's just so like gregarious that it's incredible to watch kurt cobain would have been the greatest guitar player ever if he had just not died from a drug overdose but i'm like yeah but whatever made him want to be a good musician you can't negate the thing that was in him that was also doing drugs if someone is really funny but they don't have the confidence to go up on stage and fail in front of a group then they can't ever become a right yeah yeah that's because what it takes that is what it takes. Yeah. Welcome everybody to the OG pod. I'm here with my friend from comedy, Jimmy Clifford, who is an international comedian now. Yeah, international baby. C to C. C to C. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did the Edinburgh Fringe Festival last August. That was cool. A lot of fun. That was right when we first recorded. Mm -hmm. You were headed over there. Yeah, it was wild, man. We did like something like 28 shows in 25 days in the Fringe. Uh, and you were drinking, partying, or yeah. not? Yeah, well, yes. So okay. the show that we did was the Bomb and Get Bomb show. So we had to drink every single night, which was a marathon in itself. Yeah. Um, basically, the way the show works, every time a comedian says a joke that does not get a laugh, they have to take a drink on stage. And so, you know, we, it was a great opportunity. Did they get funnier was, as they went? Um, yeah, well, it was just like, I think by doing that, we got more of the audience that we were looking for because it's a fringe festival it's an arts festival a lot of people are like well i want to go see something that's going to stimulate my mind and i'm like i do dick <laughs> jokes in the park. You know, exactly so like when we're doing like when we're advertising it as a drinking show we're getting like late night people that just want to have fun they want to get you know involved and so that was good but uh yeah dude sometimes like because one thing that i didn't anticipate was the sense of humor with like people in the uk is way different than in the us yeah and i've I, heard that but i don't know the difference it took me a while to figure it out and i don't know if i'm exact exactly like pinpointed it yet but i think the difference would be like in the us we're kind of a lot more like go 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 so if we're gonna sit down we want you to like give us a joke every 15 or 20 seconds whereas in the uk they're like a lot more willing to let you Set up a slow premise and like yeah, tell a exactly. story. And so that's why oftentimes at a place like The Fringe or like a lot of these British comedians, it'll be more like one man showy type yeah. things where there's an arc to the set. There's like a beginning, a middle and an end and it all kind of connects. Whereas in the US, it's nightclubs. So we're based on like, oh, you got 10 minutes and you want to you know, throw in 50 jokes because you just want it to be laughing the whole time. Right. And so that was something that I had to get over. Also... They're more, and this might not necessarily be the UK as much as just like an arts festival in general, but there are a lot more like, you can't joke about that kind of thing. Really? You know they're I mean? more restricted? Way more restricted. Like, I mean, I, it's so loosey-goosey in Austin, anything flies. <laughs> what's the thing, right? In Austin, I am not an edgy comedian by any stretch of the word. But people were like, dude, you're really like offensive and edgy. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Let me introduce you to some of my yeah, friends. Seriously. You know what I mean? Let me tell you a story about a man who eats somebody whole. <laughs> exactly. Like it's just it, that took a while to, to understand. And there's also weird things because a lot of the things that we take for granted that another American will know, they won't. Like I did a joke about Helen Keller. Context. They have no idea who Helen Keller is. They've never heard about her. They never read about her. nothing like zip. And I was like, that's weird. I thought that that was like an international thing or like Buffalo wings. They don't really know Buffalo wings. Another just odd. Well, little... that's just a tragedy, <laughs> right? That's what I'm saying. But uh, yeah, it was fine. You know, I totally I learned a lot about myself and I think I learned a lot more about how to like view myself from the audience's perspective. And you mock them for losing the war? Yeah, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Mocked them for a lot you of things. To. The drinking. I mean, it was in Scotland and those Scots drink man like they are heavy-handed with the pores 
You know what I mean? Not really, actually. I, th- I know Irish people drink, but it, may- it would make sense that they do. Yeah, the Scottish people just as much. I mean, anywhere it just rains, what else are you gonna do? You yeah, know? exactly. You're in the middle of nowhere. It's just fields and old castles. I mean, the place I was in Edinburgh, it's actually that's where J.K. Rowling got the inspiration for Harry Potter. So really? when you walk around, you'll see like the University of Edinburgh looks like Hogwarts. Really? Yeah. It's like a castle type uh-huh. building. Oh, totally. It's cool. so one thing I really like about Europe is the all the antiquity, like the castles and mm-hmm. all the old buildings. Yeah. I mean, you like that in theory, and then you get an apartment that's a six floor yeah. walk up, and yeah. you have to do it drunk at 3 a.m. And you're like, well, I would have loved an elevator. An elevator would be <laughs> You know what I mean? But yeah, escalator it was fun. would work too. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what are your comedy, what, what's going on in your comedy world? So right now, I'm um, doing a lot, actually. So I have my show, The Jimmy Clifford Show. We uh, drop episodes every week. Cool. And um, people call it a podcast. I wouldn't necessarily call it a podcast. It's more of like a YouTube show because the way that we edit it and the things that we do, it's more visual than it is audio. So like you can listen to it on Spotify or, po- or Apple Music or whatever. But you know, we just add so much more flavor into it. Like our producer, JJ, he, um, he doesn't talk as much on the show, but then like his sense of humor comes in so clearly when you watch the episode, you know what I mean? Which is interesting that you can like be, still be such a part of it. I mean, you totally understand from editing yeah. these clips that like it's a, two different a lot, voices. Yeah. A lot of the story that you tell is done in the editing. Mm-hmm, totally. And so I love doing that every week. We have, you know, wacky guests on all the time. Uh, I'm also doing a new podcast with Colton Dowling and Martin Hen called Season Vets, which is like a true crime sports podcast. And uh, that's a lot of fun because Martin loves sports. I love sports. Colton does not love sports. And so like every week. What's the crime part? You're like investigating. Well, we do, yeah, we like go in, in depth on like these different stories. Like we have an episode coming out about um, Qatar and how we think that they might have bribed to get the World Cup. You know, because there's no oh, yeah. reason that it should have been there. I mean, they had to build seven soccer stadiums. And didn't they use like slave labor or something? Oh, people they died say? during it. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. Th- so just for an example, uh, I think the World Cup was in China the last time. And they ended up spending like maybe $2 billion on the World Cup. Whereas in Qatar, they've spent $220 billion preparing for this Something's World Cup. Something's going on there. Yeah, there's like no reason it should have been there. It was ranked like 113th. You know, they went... they. We're out of the World Cup within the first round. Like, it, it, there's a whole <laughs> lot going on there. Um, and this is the first I ever even heard of it, Qatar. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Such a small little place just that would loaded with money. Um, but so we kind of talk like, about o- that oil stuff. Oil money or what do they got? Oh, it's like the royal family, dude. Yeah, oil money. Like, big, big bucks. Wow. Yeah. Like, it's hard to get, hard for me to get into the World Cup. I thought I saw maybe Hans posted this. Somebody had a good meme where they were like, the most exciting parts from every game. And it was just like two scores. Yeah, exactly. I know. Soccer is much more boring than like football or basketball because it's just slower pace. It's just running around. I'm sitting here for 90 minutes and there's one score. And then they fake injuries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're flopping all the time. It's ridiculous. But when you do get a score, it is pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. What's interesting actually is so uh, when I went to Ed. I met a girl and uh, we started dating and I brought her to a Dallas Cowboys game and the thing that she was most surprised about is she's like you let the fans enter together and I'm like yeah what do you mean she's like that does not fly in the UK like these soccer stadiums you have to fans have to enter in from opposite sides of the stadium and they never commingle otherwise they would just fight the entire time man maybe they're better than us I know, like they're taking their sport seriously <laughs> they do i mean they're like oh manchester united and then they just go crazy whereas like you know there are fights at football games but it's not like we have to enter from two separate entrances you know but um so yeah we're doing that podcast with colin and, and like oh here's a perfect example of how the podcast goes basically uh we did a one episode where it was like nfl pickums where we pick we look at the matchups for the week and we choose who we think is going to win martin does it based on like the team and how well they're performing this year and on the most recent episode colton did it based on which mascot he thinks is more anti-semitic <laughs> so he's like "Ooh, the chargers that's pretty anti-semitic i'm gonna have to go dolphins so he's a lot of legacy hate in there yeah like, exactly what is going on with this anti-semitism dude i don't know kanye's a trendsetter i guess i guess i yeah is that the trend we want to be setting uh, did you see the shit he said on alex jones oh my god he's he's been crazy i mean it's this, so fucking crazy i don't understand why we keep listening to him we're like 
like we all know that he's crazy. It'd be like putting a guy that's yelling on the subway on like the biggest platform in the world and yeah. being like, so tell me what you think. And then getting angry based on his opinions. Well, except if that guy made like banger music every single time. I know. Did you hear he just dropped a new song? Really? Oh, yeah, I'll really have to good. check it out. Really? really? What is it? It's really oh, good. That's oh, the problem. Google. They're like, oh, you know, it's this, the, mo the best song he's dropped in five years. And he did it after he just went off on that the most funny. like wild, you know, media tangent. It makes you wonder how much of these artists are being influenced by, like, I don't know, their mental illness. <laughs> like, yeah. obviously, he's got something. You know, I think a lot of people have, like, some kind of form of, like, bipolar or schizophrenia. I don't know what it is. But yeah. whatever it is, it seems to be actually an edge. Like, it actually seems to be part of their creative I um, think abilities. Not that it has to be. Not that you have to have that mental illness to be creative or whatever. I feel so with creativity, I just think it's perspective. And I think when you have that sort of like chemical imbalance, you have a very different perspective than most people. And so that's what people find interesting about it. Hmm, that's true. Especially with comedy, it's about bringing a different perspective, a new way of looking at something. Yeah, like anyone can go in and say the same thing that we've already heard before. And we're like, okay, great. That's not really that interesting. But when some come, someone comes in with a totally new idea, you know, maybe they're crazy. It's still a new idea and we're intrigued by it. So I think that's the main so there's thing. There's so much mental illness in comedy. Now, do oh you get, some people God. get offended would you say that <laughs> there is i mean anyone i just think in entertainment offended, yeah and it's not anyone that feels the need to like get up on stage and tell a room full of people look at me this there's is something wrong with them yeah you know yeah. what i mean this is what i think pay attention to me i just i so wish all the time that i had like whatever it is inside me that would just make me happy enough to just be like you know a contractor no this is better this is, uh, more is fun. it better oh okay. it's so much more fun hang out at the creek go do podcasts during the day do mics at night May okay here's the thing like, so that's pretty fun i have a really good friend and what he does is you know he lives up in the middle of nowhere new jersey and all he cares about is snowboarding and fishing that's cool too. That dude is the happiest guy I've ever met in my life. He's not even particularly good at either, but he just likes the act of doing it. And I'm like, yeah. bro, that's so achievable. Your your dreams are like there. It's incredible. Like you you are living the best life you could every single day. I mean, that's the importance of just doing what you actually enjoy doing. Yeah, exactly. Instead of like what gives you status or what gives you prestige or even money or income or yeah, all Yeah, or like things. you talk to these comics like, why aren't I getting booked more often? And I'm like, oh my God. Such a bad attitude. I think we talked about that yeah. a little bit. Uh, one of the attitudes I used to have with YouTube that I'm discovering, unfortunately, is like YouTube doesn't recommend my stuff. YouTube mm -hmm. doesn't do me justice. Yeah. And well, then, it, you know, that's it. It just, it won't until it does. Until it does. Right. Well, but like... It, I mean, I was looking at my stats and I was like, these are on par with other people. Now, when I actually go and I'm now that I'm getting a little bit better at uh, the click through rate and, yeah. you know, actually getting people to watch the video, my retention isn't that great. <laughs> you know, it's, but it's not it's like just terrible, a skill, but right? You just keep yeah, learning yeah. how to do this thing. But, but now I'm thinking a lot of this like shadow banning and people feeling like YouTube is like not, you know, I just think their content isn't that great yet. Like yeah. their jokes aren't that good yet. They're 100%. just not that entertaining. Hundred percent yeah exactly and like that's the thing i always tell myself like you know sometimes i'll make a video where i'm like oh this is really cool i think it's gonna do really well and then it won't and i'm like oh why and then like three months later i'll look at it again and i'm like oh that wasn't that good yeah you know what i mean like yeah. i truly oh, totally. do think the best rises to the top and yes. as long as you just keep producing stuff it's gonna pop eventually or if not who cares just enjoy the act of doing it like you yes, said exactly one of my favorite things that you said that i think about a lot is the quote maybe you can remember who it was from that anything creative is like turning on an old dirty faucet yeah exactly. and it's like kind of muddy water at first but if you just let it keep running out it mm -hmm. becomes clear and clean yeah that was ed sheeran ed sheeran mm -hmm. oh that's great it was ed sheeran huh. yeah that's i great. um i love all those like types of quotes you know what i mean yeah. just like because i think that this it's is true, a though. very yeah 100 percent, it's true and when you have that attitude about it you're just gonna be a lot happier as a person and then therefore your content will be better and patient with yourself and you know accepting a bombing and mm -hmm. you don't you know you it's all like a learning and improving process one of the things i've been thinking about lately is how comedy is evolving so when i don't really know the history of comedy like perfectly but it seems like it came from this place where it was kind of like more slapsticky kind of like or maybe that was just the time mm -hmm. um but it was are you talking just, comedy or are you talking stand-up in particular? Stand-ups in particular. Okay, so I guess, yeah. No, I am talking comedy, but I'm, I'm, I, I wonder how stand-up is evolving specifically from podcasting and YouTube because they just go so well hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Like they're perfect for each other. You're going to be mining material or you know generating material in a podcast 
and then all of that is like baked and built to go on YouTube yeah. as, as well as comedy. Totally. And so they all like, yeah, like, what do you think? Of, do you so think there's anything happening there? Stand up is in a very American art form. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know this, but the way that it actually started was guys like Lenny Bruce would go and they would be talking to the audience in a strip club in between performers. At a strip club? Yeah, that's where it started. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, well, actually, if we're if we're going back even further before Lenny Bruce, um, who you know, uh, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. So what he did was he would just start writing these funny little uh, articles in newspapers. And then he noticed that there was this one guy that would take all of his articles and he would bring them on stage and read them to people. And they, he was selling out theaters and doing all this. And he's like, these are my art. This, I can do this? So then he started doing that. And then as stand-up kind of grew, guys like Lenny Bruce would go to strip clubs. And that's where like a comedy club idea really started. And you got to think, this is not a happy group of people that they're talking to. <laughs> yeah. They went to a strip club for yeah. a reason. They don't want to hear you talk right. about whatever the fuck. So that's why I think... How do jokes you... compete with titties? Come on, this exactly. is be hard. <laughs> and so I think that's why... American stand-up is like boom, boom, yeah, boom, boom, punchy. boom. Whereas to be more to in the UK, they're like, mm, okay, let's let's dissect this idea, and it's a little different. And so then you know went from there, and it started to grow a little bit. You know, you got comedy clubs, you got this, you got that. And I think with the dawn of podcasting, because people listen to podcasts in their car as they drive to work, they listen to it while they work out, while they run. Mm -hmm. People are a lot more comfortable with the individual, and so when you're going to see stand-ups. You're not just going to see Jerry Seinfeld because I saw him on the TV show and I yeah. want to hear the funniest hour that he has. You go because, oh, I love Shane Gillis. I listen yeah. to him every single week. Yeah. I just want to see Shane. Right. And that's where the difference is. And so I think that's why a lot of podcast, I mean, uh, a lot of stand ups are becoming a lot more honest in their stand up and talking about their personal lives. And they don't feel the need to necessarily just be as relatable to everyone else because they already have that built-in context yeah that context is another thing we talked about mm -hmm. well i think we talked about but is a huge part of comedy yeah totally like if you're in edinburgh like you're talking about like they don't know the same references the same people mm -hmm. and that's something that i always think about even in terms of like creating content on youtube is how much do, do you explain how much do you assume that somebody knows because they clicked on this thumbnail and title they have some context already mm -hmm. you know that's a hard thing to figure out in yeah, storytelling I, and entertainment i totally agree Generally. i think that's interesting because i mean i'm still trying to figure out that kind of context stuff where like am i over explaining something should right. i just go for the meat and bare bones i think on youtube you're probably better off over explaining because if you do yep. people can just skip, skip it right and that helps but like it's almost the opposite in stand-up, though, because yeah. if you are over, yeah, you're losing the momentum of the actual joke, and then they get to the punchline before you, then it's gone. Exactly. And it just it totally doesn't work. And I noticed you that want a them lot. To come, you want them to feel a punchline is coming, and then you hit it with them. And, you know, like there's like a double effect that I've had a very few times when I've tried. 100%. And that's actually another thing that I found interesting about Edinburgh is they don't like the rhythm of that. They don't want to know when the punchline's coming. They want you to hide it. The whole time. So whole it just time. comes out of blue or whatever. Left yeah. Field. Like when you are listening to a comic and, and you can feel like, oh, a joke is about to come. Like um, there's a, a Ryan Long joke that I love where he goes, uh, did you know there are 72 genders? And that's awesome because that means that men are better than 71 genders. <laughs> but you can tell that there's going to be a punchline yeah. right after he says that's awesome because you know the context of who he is and whatever. But like someone like Daniel Sloss, who is a Scottish comedian, he tries to like mask and hide his jokes. So like Ricky Gervais just masks jokes in it. And it, se it comes off as a lot more just like witty than it is funny. But like I think that actually is kind of my style. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing is like everybody finds their own kind of like style and rhythm. But it, it interests me that like when you do that in an American club, it doesn't work as well. Right. Because like let's say, you know, you're at the Creek in the Cave and you're doing a set and it's part of a showcase. So there's seven comics going and you're fourth comic in the line. Right. The audience has already been conditioned. It's like a it's like you a have music. the rhythm. It is music, right? And so then when you change that rhythm, yes. they're a little confused. confused. And so you kind of want to keep it going. Whereas in the UK, people are doing this like ta 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 and then I go and I'm like and they're like, whoa, that was weird. So you have to like 
mold your set differently. Not that you're going to like change who you are or what you're saying, but like, just like you would talk differently with one friend group than you would with the other. It's totally. the same vibe. Yeah. Tailoring your, mm -hmm. tailoring your comedy. Um, it's a hard thing to figure out like, uh, your style, your voice, like what is your unique approach to entertainment? Like, what do you have to offer a value to people? Do you know what's interesting is recently I've noticed that I think my standup has been getting much better and I've been doing much better on stage because I stopped caring. <laughs> you like, hit like you bombed enough times in a row or something? Like, well, how did that It's not that I bombed happen? enough times in a row. Or you just like, got comfortable. Well, I got comfortable in the sense that like, I know that I know how to do this and whether the show goes well or not isn't going to change anything. And so I'm like, okay, let's go. And then I'm kind of, I'm just like kind of, I, I guess comfortable is the right word, but it's just like, um, like I truly don't care whether it goes well or if it doesn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're just here to do your best. And, and it becomes a lot more fun for me right. to do it that way. And yeah. I've been enjoying stand up a lot more because of it. But like one of the things, and I think this is something that a lot of comics fall into that I think is probably the worst habit you can do. And people always say it and it's a lot easier to say it than it is to live it. But like stop caring what comics think. They don't matter. That's hard though, because those are the people that, that kind you of care about. Yeah, you uh, their opinion. I know, but ironically, they're going to be more impressed when you don't care about their opinion than when you do. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, like truly, like when I just, you know, when you, when you first come to Austin, I was like, oh, I want, I want to do well. I want all these guys to be like, oh, Jimmy, he's a good comic, blah blah blah. And then I would just eat dicks. You know, I just bomb. I was impressed. The first time I saw your show at Creek, I was like, shit, this guy's really funny. <laughs> Thank like, you. Yeah. But it was just like, I, I felt so much better and more comfortable since I stopped caring about it. I'm like, I already know these guys. But I think maybe part of what that is, is it, is it not caring? Like, I don't care if this goes good or bad, or is it just like, I'm doing my best to have a good time, a good show. Yeah, like, I, I not doing my, my best. Like I'm under pressure. Just like, let's just have fun. We're going to hang out. It is what it is. Yeah. If it bombs, it's fine. We're, you know, just going to try to get in the next day. So it's fine. Yeah. Like I did a show the other day and it was like it was such a fucking hell gig. Like <laughs> it, it's just so much about it was ridiculous. You know, there was like a fog machine and the audience was still coming into the room while I walked on stage. People are talking. Uh, it was just like all over the place. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do my set. I'll, I'll put all the effort that I would need to do for a set. But afterwards, I'm going to go to in and out and it's going to be fantastic there either way. <laughs> and I set went really well because of it. Oh, now you got me hungry. What's your In-N-Out order? Oh, I mean, I went off. I did a double-double double combo double. meal plus a cheeseburger Animal plus a style? milkshake. Yeah. Hell yeah. What flavor? <laughs> uh, for what? Milkshake. Oh, chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, dude, for sure. I just, just I was like, bro, I need, a, I need like some comfort food, you know? Yeah. But it was good. So I, I think that's the best piece of advice I can give people is just like, do it for yeah, you. Just do it for you. Yeah. yeah. And everything is like that. If you're doing something for people's approval or for somebody's like favor or because you want to get some outcome, that's mm -hmm. never going to work. Yeah. You have to do things because you're intrinsically motivated and enjoy doing them, mm -hmm. especially things creative because they take so much effort and they yield so little reward. I know. Like, right? honestly, dude, if I was just to go code, like I, you know, that's my whole life is like software engineering. I could make a hundred times, whatever, you know, yeah. anything I could ever hope to make on YouTube or, uh, comedy. So now the way I think of it is anything I ever do make in the entertainment world, I'm putting a 10 X multiplier on it. Yeah. And so if I make $1, that's like 10 in the real world. Yeah, totally. $1 made doing what you love, what exactly. you enjoy. Yeah. hundred percent. And it, it's interesting because like, you know, we have friends that are in the real world and they're doing the thing and you look at your, their life and you're like, Oh, that seems so easy. But then like, that's just because you're in your head all the time. And then I went home for Thanksgiving and I'm talking to all these friends and they're like, dude, it is so cool what you do. And you don't realize that like, even though these people seem like they have a great life and it's easier and they get to just go home and watch TV and play video games and go hiking and go fishing or whatever. They're also looking at you like, I'm jealous. I wish that I had whatever weird thing in you that I could do that too. 
And I, I think that what they want isn't to do like stand up or podcasting or YouTube shows or whatever. What they want is to find something that they love mm -hmm. and that they want to pursue as yeah. a career. And I think a lot of people just don't know what they want to do and they don't try things out. Like you have to try stuff out to find out what you enjoy. Yeah, I failed at a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I failed at so much. What, I don't know if you, if you agree with this, but I've noticed for some reason a lot of comedians were interested in magic from a young age. The gathering, the no, card? No, like just magic. Oh, oh magic. Yeah, like, yeah, make totally. Card tricks and yeah, all that kind of yeah. like, I, When I was in high school, I was like, oh man, magic is so cool. And looking back at it, I'm like, what a dork. But <laughs> It like, is dorky. It's it so is. dorky. Yeah. But it's like I had so many weird little hobbies that I did before I found stand up and like content creation as like the thing that in I enjoy most. I think there's some kind of parallel now that you mention it between magic, stand up comedy, and stripping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what is the common thread? between all those look at live me. performance yeah look at me <laughs> live performance look at me um i don't know like something about not shame like but just like putting yourself really bare in the open yeah because that's a lot of what stand-up is it's like you versus them this is something i've been thinking about yeah totally is the performer is actually getting something from the audience in a way that is like not unfair because they're taking the risk mm -hmm. they're on stage and if it goes, if it doesn't go well, then they're the ones that bomb. But if it does go well, the audience is like giving them something, energy, adoration, adoration, something. There's like some transfer happening from the crowd to the stage. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what that is, but I feel like it's the same thing in anything, like in YouTube, uh, through comments and engagement and all these things. Like, yes, you're putting stuff out there to try to entertain people or inform them on YouTube or whatever it is you have your, your motivations, but like, and, and you get paid for it if you do it really well through, through brand deals and through ads, advertising, all those things. Yeah. But I think the, the payment that you really get is immediately and live from the audience. Now I have a question. What do you prefer getting that sort of, you know, flowers or gratification live or, in comments online? Um, I think it would depend a lot on everything. Like if it was live and it was like a real, like everything being equal, same number of people's live versus the same number of people on YouTube, of course live, because you're gonna get that energy times 10. Well, I'm saying like, let's say you do a set, right? You do a set at the creek, you walk off stage, someone walks up to you and goes, that was funny as fuck. Yeah, you'd rather have that. Or they comment on the video, that was funny as fuck. I think one that was funny as fuck in person is worth five comments. Interesting, because I was thinking about it. Um, I did Kill Tony the other day, and hey, I got yes. a bunch of people reaching out to me saying nice things, which was very sweet. But whenever I'm in like doing stand-up, I much prefer them to walk up to me and say, like, oh my God, that was great. I prefer that over like a comment. But if someone wants to like go in depth and be like, that was so funny, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I get uncomfortable in person. Whereas when I see it, like a big long post written in a comment, that feels much better. Yeah. Yeah. There's, weird? there's nuances there, but I think generally like the feeling that you're chasing in live entertainment is that immediate feedback from the audience. Yeah. And I don't, you know, you're never going to get that from YouTube. It's nice to get a video that is no, one out of 10 mm -hmm. and you know, that always feels good, but it's not like the same as getting, um, I don't know, real laughter, yeah. you know, oh, like, well, the laughter, that's, that's a totally different thing. I was just mostly talking about like the comments, but yeah, laughter, I think is the greatest thing in the world. Like it's my favorite thing. I would, even if you're just hanging out in the back, oh, and that's why, that's literally, I think the reason I do stand up is yeah. just why so you feel can hang out in the back. Yes. hang out Seriously. with comedians in the back. Dude, that's a big part of it. Actually, it's the, it's that's the, the only price you got to pay to, oh my God, to deserve so the company or whatever to earn mm -hmm. the company. Cause yeah. we, cause everybody has to take a turn being embarrassed and you know, like putting themselves on stage. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it, it puts us all on the same level too. Right. And that low, what is that level? That level is like, we're people that are willing to put ourselves out there and, uh, you know, take a little bit of a risk for mm -hmm. the chance that we do something funny or like say something funny. Yeah. Just like, it's wild that we're willing to, uh, risk all of the humiliation that come, comes with it just for like a, ha ha. Yeah. Just, <laughs> you know, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah. Like that feels good when you yeah. start. Like, that was a, worth it. Oh my God. I'm so validated. <laughs> like, there's something there. You know what I mean? Like hours and hours of just going over yeah. your notes for like something that's so fleeting. Yeah. But 
Yeah. It, yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into it. I'm not really focused on comedy uh, in terms of stand up right now. I really want to get to the point where I feel confident in my ability to create a good show on YouTube, mm -hmm. both through this podcast and I have another channel called Hot Takes, which is actually a pretty strong comedy outlet for me. It definitely scratches a very similar itch yeah, yeah, yeah. of just saying the thing. Like you want to get your idea out there. Yeah, I agree. I think um, over the past couple of years, I've really focused to, uh, on stand up just so I can get a more comfortable and uh, feel like I belong. And now that I do, I'm kind of focusing more on the content creation and trying to like build the actual audience yep. just so I can stop fucking barking on the street like comedy show, comedy show, yep. comedy show. You know what I mean? I just want people to come. Right, <laughs> like, right. Because uh, now I'm, I'm doing another show, a uh, weekly show at the Creek. So I'm going to be running two weekly shows in Austin. What? And I have the That's two awesome. podcasts. What's your Creek show called? And the other um, it's called Unsupervised. It's awesome. Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Nice. It's, uh, it's a showcase and it's just going to be like, you know, whatever wild comedians I, uh, I book for the week. And they're awesome. going to be like local guys. And they're also going to be like people coming in from out of town. Because thankfully, you know, I've been able to travel a lot i've been doing a lot of college shows so um i reach out to these colleges i book uh shows and then we me and a couple buddies will go out like we've done the university of miami we did uh kansas university the other day we just did southwestern university Dude, on that's friday awesome. yeah and it's fun because like there used to be this huge market for comedians in colleges and then it was like everyone was getting too pc and they didn't want to have comedians that would like push the boundaries and I think the kids really appreciate us going in and being like, we're going to talk to you like regular people. Nice. And uh, we're just having fun. It, it it sprung back or whatever. Yeah, I, kind of. Like it I went mean, too far one way and now it's like... Well, the difference another. is because I don't go through the actual colleges. I go through fraternities because fraternities have to hold events. And so I'm like, hey, why don't we do this comedy show as a way to raise money for your charity? It's like a ridiculously good idea. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You know, just because all so we want to do. So you send them like a reel or like your Instagram pages. Yeah. The Instagram page is pretty yeah. big. So like they can just see that. I have plenty of content online. They can check out all that stuff. And I also, you know, we've done plenty of colleges now we've done like nyu fordham uh we did ramapo miami all, all over the place do they fly out there or? yeah to, uh oh, you yeah. know depending on the school and whatever deal i set up uh, miami flew us out there they put us up in a hotel we did the show they ended up making like ten thousand dollars for their uh charity so that was great and um i mean you're getting there man that is the deal like yeah. that's what real comedy is like yeah. you're going places and telling people that you don't know what you think <laughs> exactly 100 percent. and the kids appreciate it like they, they they want the comedy and the good thing is because it's with fraternities and it's not with like the university in itself we're not restricted in what we can and cannot say yeah that's a really good idea yeah don't go through the colleges go through the frats mm -hmm. <laughs> that's going to give you much better uh population or like a, b a better audience yeah I will say sometimes it gets funny. Like we did a show at Southwestern University and, uh, you know, we, we booked it through the fraternity and the, um, all the dudes in the fraternity loved it. Like they were like, this was hilarious. We loved all the comics. Their girlfriends did not. <laughs> Their girlfriend, like there was, cause you know, they're college kids. So they're out, they're drinking, they're talking. So there was a lot of talking amongst them during the show, which was rude. And so uh, Dean Stanfield, you know, Dean Stanfield, mm -hmm. so funny. Yeah. He walks up and he just goes, uh, guys going to be quiet. There's a lot of talking. Men, handle it. Handle it. Handle <laughs> and it. every girl in the room went, excuse me? <laughs> And they just got up and it was it was hilarious he's a good example of somebody who has a lot of stage presence oh dean yeah dean is he like he was born knowing that he's going to be famous one day and i think that dean would be a great famous dude you know what oh, I mean? he's on his way yeah one he of my favorite to things grinding. to do with dean is like whenever i'm at the creek if i was working the door and someone would walk in and i would see him there i'd be like do me a favor go up and say are you dean stanfield and then he they would and he'd be like yeah you want a photo or something come on over here i'll buy you a beer and it's just like they don't know who he is but yeah. he's just so like it is funny gregarious to... that it's incredible to watch yeah but the trolling that comics do to each other oh, is hilarious incredible. but ruthless oh ruthless exactly <laughs> ruthless. yeah but that's the fun part it's like you know that they're never gonna bullshit you yeah that's true and that makes everything like the best part is that you're getting real shit mm -hmm. like my mom will see things that i i'll tell my comedian friends or i'll be on the phone and i'll say things she'll be like how could you say that to your friend yeah and i'm like you would say it behind their back isn't yeah, that worse true, actually 
Yeah, that is worse. <laughs> People say everything. The difference is a comic will say it to your face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm being 100% with you right now. But you, why do they do that? Do they want to see a reaction? They want to get a rise out of you? Probably a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I, don't, I think comedy is the one art form more than any other that doesn't value bullshit. That hate that despises bullshit. Yeah. That like is, I mean, comedy is anti bullshit. That's what a hack is. It's a bullshit comedian. Yeah. Like, you know, you'll see an artist where they're like, oh, yeah, I was just trying to capture the, and you're like, this is a fucking blank canvas. What do you do? What are you talking about? Capture anything. You didn't right. do anything. So we're just like, and I think the reason that we're so much that way is a joke either works or it doesn't. And it's not necessarily subjective. Mm -hmm. When you're in a club, and you do a joke on stage, it works or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so you can't bullshit anyone. We're like, uh, you know, when you're a musician, you can sing a song for three minutes and people are going to be silent. And whether you killed or not, you don't really know. That's also kind of true. Like there's less, uh, like if they're not laughing, that's... You're failing. <laughs> you're, you're failing. Right, right, right. It's like, it's the closest thing to justice. Yeah, live. And like, even, let's real say you, time. you know, you have a bunch of shows where you're just killing it and you feel real good about yourself and you go up with a little too much swagger. Mm -hmm. Bomb. Nuked. Yeah. Bring you right back down. Yeah. Where that doesn't happen in yeah. music. It's a good thing, though. Like, if somebody's going to get that much attention and get to be living that much of a life, they should have to wade through some serious shit. Yeah, in exactly. Terms of bombing. And, <laughs> and I think that's why you see comics, they're able to get good at so many other creative arts because they're, they're comfortable like comfortable failing yeah they're comfortable failing and they're not afraid to fail yeah we're like you know you ever see like a musician that tries to do stand-up and then they just fill the room with all of their fans and so no matter what they say they killed and you're like no that was not good whereas a comedian will be like yeah no i suck it and bill burr plays drums he's like i suck at the drums you listen you're like you don't suck but he knows he that knows i'm not as good, good as i should be or whatever i want to be and so you know they're a lot better at like maintaining their expectations. Yeah, comics, um, they're they're kind of a rare breed. Um, Thank God. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, are they rare, group. or are there lots of people that have the same comedy gene? Like, is there a difference between comedy and musicians and other entertainers? Are they all just bids for attention? Well, I think like there is a big difference because, yeah, like uh, actors, they don't give a shit about free speech. You know, like they don't, I mean, as far as I know, like they aren't out trying to call out bullshit. Yeah. I would say it's the exact opposite with actors. I don't think they like free speech. I think that they're oftentimes right. saying you're not allowed to say that because they're like, you know. Yeah. The comedy breed is a person that's willing to say whatever they want to say and just for the chance that it works out. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of people I think that are funny enough to be a stand-up comedian but they can't because they don't have that intrinsic thing in them. That's like, like, um, is it, is there something in them or do have they not built the skill? It's a total skill. It's a real skill. Yeah. But I think it's whatever is in you that's willing to do it. Like people always talk about potential. They're like, um, Oh, you know, Kurt Cobain would have been the greatest guitar player ever if he had just not died from a drug overdose. But I'm like, yeah, but whatever, was in him that was mm -hmm. made him want to be a good musician th you can't negate the th thing that was in him that was also doing drugs right like people Those are, are the same exactly person. what they are yes so if someone is really funny but they don't have the confidence to go up on stage and fail in front of a group then they can't ever become a comedian. right yeah yeah because that's what it takes that is what it takes yeah and so like people are always like wasted potential and i'm like no people achieve everything that they're going to achieve you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you can hope for yourself to work harder and you can push yourself because you might, you're the only one that can know I, whatever's in here, I know I can do this. But if you don't, then people are like, oh, I don't know. I think if you don't do it, then that's why you couldn't. I think that's a interesting perspective. If you don't do it, that's why you couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of something somebody said that was something like, we all get what we want out of life, like in the end. Mm -hmm. And whatever we got, that's because it was what we really wanted. Yeah, that's exactly. what we really wanted. And but a lot of people don't know what they want. Yeah. Like and, and a lot of people, the problem is they don't know what they want and they're not willing to try stuff out to figure out whether or not that is the thing for them. 
Yeah, I failed at so many different things. I mean, not necessarily failed like, oh, I want to do this. I'm going to do it. It was like I would just try all these different things out. Like, you know, when I was a kid, I used to go, uh, I, I would take lessons for tango dancing. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I learned like Bali dancing. I did magic. I, I, I played sports. I did acting. I did directing. I would write stuff. Like I tried so I p tried playing the guitar. I tried playing the trumpet. Like there were so many things that I just dipped my toe in before I realized like, oh, this is what I want to do. That's awesome. And though, I think a lot of people... such a head start like to, 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 but I think that's your personality. Yeah. It's like you're saying, like you are the I get type of easy. person <laughs> you know as I mean? a, well, but yes, but like also as a kid, you were intrinsically motivated to try all those things mm -hmm. and you weren't too scared to do them. Like I probably had a lot of those motivations too. Difference is I didn't go to wrestling practice or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't until way later in life that I got the confidence to be like, okay, what is it that I really want to do? Where do I, how do I really want to spend my time? And even just like ask those type of questions versus like you're naturally just exploring whatever you're interested in, whether it's sports or entertainment or stand up. And then that is how you uh, found stand up and comedy is through trying all those different things. But you have to be willing to put yourself out there and try those things in order to even find it to begin with. Yeah, I think one of the things that my parents did a really good job of is they're like, no one's gonna give you anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you want something, go take it. Like if you yeah. wanna have a, a fulfilled life, find out what will fulfill it. And you know, a lot of people are just like comfortable kind of cruising in the safe and you know practical way, but then they are not as happy. Yeah. Like I thought, you know, I love film and I, I want to be a filmmaker. And so I went to film school and then I worked at a production company in New York for five years. And I realized, oh, I'm not happy. I don't like this. I don't want to have to wake up at 6 a.m. and then work a 12 hour shift just to make like less than a minimum wage worker for, and, you know, I'm getting coffee and I'm picking up boxes and I'm doing all this shit. And then I was like, is this helping me with what I want to do, which is make films? I'm like, no, it's not. And so although people can think in my head, oh, this is what you have to do in order to get better at the, it's not. I think like the best way that I've ever gotten better at filmmaking was by making films. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it comes back to the running water. You just got to keep, you know, producing that stuff. But and... people think, oh, I'm in the world of it and I'm on set and I'm seeing other people do it. But it's like, that's not the same thing. You heard the quote, the man in the arena? No. I don't know. It's a famous person wrote it. I can't remember the full thing. It's like a couple paragraphs, but it, uh, it's a poem actually. And it talks about how the credit always goes to the man who's actually in the arena on the sidelines. We all want to jeer at that man and say like, Oh, he messed up. Like it's easy to point out how the person who's actually doing the thing failed. Yeah. What's hard is to actually go put yourself on stage. Totally. That's what's hard. Yeah, exactly. And like, especially with the film world it's such bullshit because people are like well I, I could make such a good film i just don't have the budget yeah the budget dude anytime that you catch yourself thinking that way like Ridiculous. you gotta rip that bullshit out of you i'm prone to thinking that way yeah and yeah like the truth is everyone has a lot of ability to take control of their lives in any way in any way like you can just start sleeping and eating better and that's going to give you more energy and then that can help you, you know, perform better and get a raise at work. And, you know, like you could start whatever you want to do. It doesn't have to be podcasting. It doesn't have to be entertainment. Yeah. Whatever you're interested in, you can cultivate energy for that and uh, improve in that. But have you ever heard of Sean Baker? Um, yeah. Is he a... He's a filmmaker. Oh, no, I guess I haven't. Then. So, yeah, really cool dude. He's a filmmaker. He did movies like The Florida Project. And uh, he did another one called Tangerine. And I love Tangerine because he filmed it all on an iPhone. That's cool. The whole movie is on an iPhone. And you're like, oh, you can do anything you want. Yes. Like, you know, a show like The Tonight Show has these thousand dollar cameras and cameramen operating them and all of these guests and all of these lights. And it doesn't get nearly the viewership that Rogan does with yes. two DSLRs. Yes. And well, but what's so funny about that is the more complicated you make things, the more expensive it is to maintain them. Mm -hmm. Now you need some guy who needs to operate that camera that nobody knows how to use exactly. versus if you just use an iPhone, everybody knows, you know, like you Boom. can find somebody on the street. Hey, hold this for five minutes. And I'm actually pretty excited about the next generation of creative tools for content creators. Um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot and I cannot believe 
I almost wonder if I like knew that this was going to happen in the back of my mind. And as part of made me what made me want to do YouTube and comedy, because I think content creators are about to get superpowers compared to normal people from artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we already use the captions app or how do you add captions to your stuff? Oh, manually. Manually. Okay. Yeah. Well, so like imagine if instead of taking the time to do that, you just told an AI, give me three variants with uh, captions on uh, this video where all of the ums and the buts and the filler words are removed. Any background audio that's distracting is taken out and, yeah. uh, and the audio is leveled between everyone participating in the conversation. And then it gives you like five variants and you listen to each one and then you pick your favorite and then you're like, okay, now color grade this with something warm or, you know, something yeah. that matches the tenor of the conversation. Now slice and cut five more clips and slice in popular media media. You're going to be able to write this, mm -hmm. like describe just like you would to a person yeah. to an AI. And it's going to do this. I think in less than I'd say less than three years. Wow. Because the two things that happened this year that is going to change this. So I'm a tech guy previously to entertainment. A lot of my background is at Snapchat. We did a lot of AI stuff. Yeah. And we were very early in like the filter. I mean, we pioneered filters. Yeah, like we totally. started all that stuff. Uh, it was uh, Victor. Uh, can't remember his last name. But anyway, we bought a company in, in Ukraine. And so... Uh, this AI stuff is getting so freaking powerful. So the two things that happened this year was uh, this new AI model called Stable Diffusion. It basically downloaded every image on the planet and trained itself on that set of images. And so now there's kind of like this... Um, debate of like is that copyright like they they trained on like copyrighted material or whatever but they, but they, they, what people don't see is like that's all just data now that's math it's like yeah. in the model there's not like picasso in there and it's like I mean, no it's all transformed into just data the data just yeah. zeros and ones in a model and then um you know the, how this stuff works is kind of complicated but it's also not you know it's like a lot of it is uh, just trying to rebuild our brains. We're trying to rebuild our brains. Like, mm -hmm. What does our brains have? We can compute stuff. We can think that's processing. We can store things, memory. That's like a hard drive. And so we're trying to rebuild all that. But how exciting is that going to be to like... No, that's really cool. Yeah. I yeah. also, I love the idea of like, um, like with crypto and with uh, like NFTs, I think that that's going to be a big deal in the way that we can like monetize what yep. we do. Yep. Like I think that places like Netflix, YouTube, all these places, I don't want to have to deal with any of them. You know what I mean? Like people are like, I'll talk to comics yeah. like, man, I just want a manager. I'm like, I don't want any of that. Yeah. I want to do all of it on my own. Decentralized. Yeah. I just want to be able to make something on my own and then put it out and then people can buy it. And it's like, when you do that, I won't have to then make it as expensive because I'll be getting all of it yes. rather than like, I have to pay this dude, I have to pay this guy, I have to pay this guy. And I just, I love that idea because everything will be much cheaper. It'll be much more um, easy for people to get access to it. Like rather than have to get a Netflix subscription to watch this entire show, I can just buy it through the NFT. Yeah. Yeah. So like, so content creators, we're entering a fun world, I think. Um, but what's interesting will. is I think everyone is becoming a content creator. Like, that was a very good idea. I was listening to, uh, not listening to, um, yeah, I drive Uber. And so last night I had this woman who she is a, uh, a jeweler and she was on the phone talking to one of her other jeweler friends. And she's like, yeah, I just, you know, I have to like block out like three or four hours just to go through and take photos of everything for the social media pages. Yeah. And I'm like, you make jewelry and you're worrying about content. Like yep. this is wild. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everyone does it. Everyone. Well, they have to because the it's kind of like um, being on social media back in the day. Like not everybody was on it at first. Mm -hmm. You know, like everyone is going to have a YouTube. I don't know. Maybe not everyone because people, some people are just not interested. Oh, my cousin, he's a crazy hermit dude. All he like, he, uh, you know, he's a big science guy. So he computer, he's a computer programmer, but he lives in the middle of nowhere, Jersey. He has hobbies, including falconry and beekeeping. So he made, <laughs> that's awesome. I know he made, he has like three or four beehives on his property. And he, uh, last harvest season, he harvested like 70 pounds of honey. He doesn't have any social media whatsoever. That's awesome. And he just goes to like farmer's markets and sells honey. Well, that's a pretty cool life too. Oh, that's he loves cool it. Too. He loves it. He just reads books about like birds all day. <laughs> but, it, but if you're an entrepreneur, even if you're just like selling jewelry, you know, yeah. like you want to be able to no, distribute exactly. I would say your most own... people in the world. Yeah. I think, I think 
the fact that he do- isn't on social media and he doesn't create content in that way is what makes it noteworthy because totally. everyone else <laughs> probably does. happier you yeah, know like, probably i think it's not totally good for us to have all of these you know short-term attention span and just constantly going for that they call it dopamine you mm-hmm. know like people are chasing dopamine. or what about the fact that like how many times have you just been in a conversation with someone and it's fun like you're in the back of a bar you're having a drink you're like oh my god this is so much fun and then they're like we should make this a podcast and you're like can't we just do this can't we just yeah. be happy with one another in this moment yeah. why does this all have to be then content yeah. you know it's like the people that are always posting stories on Snapchat always blogging blog yeah all of that and there is something about posting about something that does kind of take the magic away from it 100 percent, because then you're not there anymore like that yeah. connection was like you know it's kind of like you're riding like this train and then once you take a photo of it, you have to hop off the train in order to look at it and take the photo. You exactly. Know? Exactly. It takes you out of the moment mm-hmm. and out of the present. That's and why I love content creating, but I don't want it necessarily to be my personal life. Like I keep my personal life yeah. very personal. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Like v- vlogging is like a big part of how people made it on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not too interested. Like in that. Casey Neistat, you know Casey Neistat. I well, he's a very cool guy. No, I, I, I love mean, Casey Neistat. Says, I think it's yeah. very cool. But he even says he goes when I was doing that daily vlog, I, I wasn't living a life. I was living the yes, vlog. Yes, right, right, right. Every I, he, single I moment of my life, I was like, how can I put this into the vlog? And I didn't. In, I wasn't happy. Yeah, you know what so, I mean. My so, wife was like, what are you? doing can you just be here with me right yes, now yes and, and i think that's a, something that a lot of people fall into yeah it's hard to be present and just to enjoy things you know mm-hmm. like i think a lot of people like just get into anxiety loops or whatever i don't know like well, why, i think why by not be being present. present is what puts people in those anxiety loops like over the past yeah, three years right. i've done a really a lot of work on just focusing on being present in the moment like for example even with this new ridiculous haircut someone's like so Looks is this good. like a perm thank you but they're like is this like a permanent thing and i'm like i don't believe in permanence i have it right now i have no idea what i'm gonna have you know a month from now two months from now and i'm not worried about that because i'm here right now i like this haircut so i have it you know i like doing stand-up comedy so i do it like I, i'm not worried about like later on i'm just trying to focus on the now and that doesn't mean that i'm being like hedonistic and i'm not like you know i still eat it's right and i'm still trying to like yeah i do jujitsu to keep myself in shape but that's more because i enjoy jujitsu so i want to do that now i'm not doing like oh i'm doing jujitsu now so in five years i'll be healthy you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's I just I'm, I'm always trying to focus on the present because I have a tendency if I focus on the future, then I start getting bogged down and it like well, and the crazy. present is like way more interesting. You know, like 100%. it's always yeah, especially if like you're out with people and you're like at a club or doing things mm-hmm. like that's the most interesting thing you're gonna do that day. So you should just try to like you know enjoy it to the max. Exactly, because you never know, you know how often. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't know if you, if you heard this, there was a comedian in Austin that recently died. And so you're what like, is that about? I didn't hear that. Yeah, or I did hear that, but it, I didn't know. It was a comedian. Know. You know, uh, I'm not really sure about the specifics, but a, a very funny guy named Adam. And he died. And you're like, oh, you look back on all the moments that you had with him. You're like, I wish that I could have been more present in the moment. And because you never know what's going to happen later on. You know what I mean? Was he so local thing, here? He lived here? He lived in L.A., but he spent a lot of time here. And he ran one of the, the rooms, the Sunset Strip. And oh, so, yeah, cool. just really cool dude and like very nice and kind to literally every single comic that he met. And it's just a shame because like things like that will happen in life and y- yeah. you can't ever um, prepare for that. Right. So just be present and, and enjoy everything while it's happening. And then don't worry about the future, because as long as you're working hard and you're putting your best foot forward, I truly believe it all works out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's keep grinding, man. Let's yeah, keep dude. working hard, creating content, doing our, doing our Fuck entertainment, yeah, doing comedy. Um, so what are your, your shows? So you have a Wednesday night show, 10, 30 yeah, PM, uh, 10 o'clock 10, on 10 Wednesday PM. nights at the Creek in the cave. It's called unsupervised. unsupervised. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited for that one. Every Thursday night at nine o'clock, we're doing a bomb and get bombed at poor choices. Um, I do the a podcast called season vets with Colton Dowling and Martin Hen. And the Jimmy Clifford Show with uh, my producer, JJ, and my friend, Greg DePaul. Oh, yeah, man. And you're, he's available for uh, college gigs and shows. Yeah, colleges, man. We do a whole lot of colleges. Uh, hit me up on Instagram, the Jimmy Clifford. All right, man. Thanks so much for coming Dude, on, thanks Jimmy. thanks for having me. This is a lot yeah. of fun. That was really fun. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Peace.